I'm going to give my talk on the board today. Uh, I hope I write big enough if I start writing too small at those at the back, uh, scream or come closer. Before I start, I just want to give a bit of a background, just like Munia did. So my undergrad is actually mathematics and physics. And then I did my PhD in hard condensed matter theory on frustrated anti-ferromagnets, uh, which was a lot of fun. But at the end of that, I decided I didn't want to spend 30 years of my life doing that sort of thing. And, uh, looked around and got interested in biology. And I joined the lab of Martin Howard, who's a theorist uh, who's at the John Innes Center at the moment, who um, worked at that time on morphogen gradients and how you could read them out precisely and so on. And he's done lots of other interesting work since. But one thing I realized during that time with Martin was that not getting your hands on experimental data was extremely frustrating. And so for a second postdoc, I went to EMBL in Heidelberg and joined the labs of Lars Hufnagel and Eileen Furlong and actually learned to do Drosophila genetics um, and to actually do my own experiments and use microscopy. And then I started my lab in uh, Singapore in 2013. And actually, although I maybe originally envisaged it being kind of a, a mixture of biology and physics and so on, it's, it's almost entirely biology. Um, so nowadays, I would actually call myself a developmental biologist. Uh, my lab is entirely biologists, except for Tricia, who's here, who is uh, actually a biologist, but is learning to do theory. So she's someone who's gone from the light side back to the dark side. Um, and, uh, and so um, this is um, what I'm going to do. So that's my background and stuff. What I'm actually going to talk about today is actually stuff from... 10, which is actually sort of 10, 15 years old, but really builds on what Munia was talking about in terms of uh, a morphogen gradient, how do you read it out, what's precision, how do you actually construct a gradient? And um, I want to return to some old questions which have been raised and uh, some recent work where we try to answer that. But actually, today's going to be largely historic in that sense. Uh, tomorrow, actually, I want to then focus more on how do you actually interpret a gradient. So we're going to be looking at things like feedback, Feed forward and actually giving you some specific examples of in vivo systems. Um, and then on Wednesday, I actually want to talk about what my lab does in more sort of explicit purposes, which is actually nowadays what we focus on is how complex shape emerges in development. So all your organs have specific shapes, they have specific sizes, um, and how does that arise? And what I want to hopefully do over the course of the three lectures is go from how do you get this very basic level of positional information and translate this sort of gradient idea into, say, a functioning heart. It does uh, what you want, has specific chambers, and has a specific structure. So one other thing, and VJ has asked me to remind you of this, tomorrow there is going to be a quiz. I, I'm a fan of this sort of thing. So please bring your mobile phones at the start of tomorrow's class, or something that can uh, access the internet. And at the start of my lecture tomorrow, there will be a quiz on today's lecture. Uh, I actually need to work out prizes. Uh, we'll, we'll have prizes of some sort. Um, and I'll do the same on Wednesday, and I'll see how it works as a, as a feedback mechanism. Um, don't worry, it's not a hard quiz, all right? Um, OK, so now I understand from VJ from last week that you've actually done a reasonable amount of um, morphogens, and, or at least der derivation of the Fick equation and Fickian diffusion. Uh, is there anyone in this room who has no idea what I mean if I say Fickian diffusion? One wants to put their hands up. Well, one person does. Okay, I'll talk to you afterwards because you're in the minority of one. <laughs> um, so what I'll do is I'll work with the. I'll start with the equations which are derived from that, and then uh, we'll build on there. Um, so yeah. So today, basically, what I want to do, uh, Munia has already kind of touched upon. You know, people said, well, where's this information coming from? It comes from this thing called a morphogen gradient, and that's where I'm going to start. And then I'm going to talk about three problems. One is how precise can this gradient be? So we've already heard about bursting. That's actually kind of downstream. Upstream is like, how precise can that information be in the first place? I think you're probably going to hear an awful lot more about this from uh, Bill Bialek next week. Um, but he's more focused on the information side. What I want to really focus on is the dynamic side of this position. Um, then also what I want to focus on, and this is a key idea, I think, for physicists coming to biology, is alternative models. You sit down and you learn a specific model, and you think that's how it works. And then you quite quickly realize that, Pretty much biology does has a unique way of doing it for every single system. And it's whether you can interpret ideas correctly and what makes sense and what doesn't. And I'm going to present you some alternative models for the Bitcoin gradient formation and how we can test. And then lastly, I want to get on to sort of the, the dirty hidden thing, which is a physicist, of course. We normally have that time derivative in our equations. And we say, oh, yes, in steady state, da 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 da. da. Um, and uh, like, you know, 
biology really isn't in steady state. And I think Munir's work this morning really beautifully shows that. Like, you know, even if you see the system looks like it's in steady state, it's not. It's highly dynamic. And uh, recently, there's been some really nice work, uh, mainly actually on what uh, on bursting in dynamics, but actually there's been some recent work on uh, the gradient formation itself and how you can use dynamics to infer types of models. And that's what I want to really cover. I don't know how far I'll get through this. I haven't given a chalk talk lecture in a while, so my timing is a little bit estimated. So um, if, if I overrun, I'll just stop on time, I guess. So to start with, basically, I want to start with this simple picture, which is the, sort of the concept of the morphogen gradient. So this is you have some localized region of high concentration, uh, which is actually uh, here's my Drosophila embryo. In this case, you can imagine you have bicoid mRNA in the anterior pole. Um, anyone know how that bicoid mRNA gets there? Does the embryo make it? No. Yeah. So it's put there by the mother. Uh, I will not get into how that happens, but that's a very interesting question. Um, so you have localized uh, production, which is here. So this corresponds to this region. Then it moves through your system. And we'll talk about how it moves through the system in a bit. But normally, we assume it's diffusion. It moves away. Uh, typically, these are proteins. They have some finite lifetime. They don't last forever. So they also degrade. So they go to zero. Um, and then you can set up a gradient. And I think from looking at BJ's notes from the other day, he actually solved the, the basic model for this. And a standard solution is that this has some profile of uh, some exponential to the minus x. And the idea really is that, if you remember what Mooney was talking about with specific enhancers, two seconds. Um, these enhancers have different affinity, they have different response at different concentration levels. They also combinatorially combine at different concentration levels. And so you can actually define threshold concentrations. And so the idea is that you have different gene responses at different regions. And so a classic example in Drosophila is almost halfway through the embryo, you have hunchback which is transcribed uh, up until, I think it's 48% of the embryo length. And that is a boundary which is defined by uh, the gradient uh, of Bitcoin. Yeah. Can I be really annoying and ask you to ask me that question in about 45 minutes? Because I want to talk about how it diffuses and how it moves, but it's a bit early at this point. I would like to keep it broad now. And I'll, so if I don't talk about it, remind me, but I will. It's in my notes, uh, but I don't think it's appropriate at the moment. Um, but this is essentially the key idea to get across, right? And generally, the way to think about it, although it turns out to be wrong, is that the classic model is that in this region, you have uh, typically weak binding domains. So only if you've got really high concentration of the morphogen do you actually get sufficient binding to get response. And out here, you get strong binding domains. Um, and uh, so you only have a few molecules, but if, if the enhancers and the uh, binding elements are very sensitive, then they can bind. Um, that actually uh, turns out to not be the case uh, often, in the case for Bitcoin as well. Um, and it's it turns out that it's actually much more important on exactly as Muni talks about dynamics and the processes underlying it. And um, it's work that Eric Bischaus and others have been doing in recent years. Okay, so that's setting up the problem. Uh, so we got a gradient. And what we really want to understand at the first half of this lecture is how does this gradient form? All right. And I think it's always suffered from the problem that it is an exponential. And I think the exponential is misleading because we're like, oh, it's an exponential, it's easy. Uh, and for, I guess for most of the physicists or mathematicians in the room, you could write me down an equation very quickly, which will give me an exponential solution. And in fact, you could probably give me five. Um, there are many uh, different ways of building an exponential, and actually I'll talk about it later. And so um, I want to kind of go through how that happens and how you can build this particular one. So uh, to start off with, if we assume it's diffusion as our first process, so we've got some... Uh, Bicoid molecule, it's made here, moves around. So after some time, it has moved some distance x um, from this slot. Um, now, for a general diffusive process, 
What's the average position? Zero, right? So the morphogen doesn't know where it's going. And uh, this is something that's a bugbear of mine. And um, it was actually my, my PhD advisor once told me off for anthropomorphizing things. I was saying, oh, the electron wants to go there. And he's like, the electron does not want to go there. It doesn't have a brain. It doesn't think. Stop thinking about it like a human. And I think we do this a bit too much in biology. The bicoid molecule does not want to go to the posterior pole, right? It does not want to move from here to here. Um, and this is actually an unhelpful mindset, I think. And the point is, it's a diffusive process. It's moving randomly. If you were to follow one molecule over time, the average position it will have moved is zero, right? And that's something that's really worth bearing in mind. What's x squared? The mean one? Yeah, so it's, so dt or root dt? I heard both. <laughs> OK, um, so there's some constant here. Or we're not worried about that for now. Um, so the point here is that if you measure the mean squared, of course, the squared is positive definite. All right? So it doesn't matter if our molecule, if we'd started measuring it here, if it had moved to the left or to the right, when we measure the x, that goes to zero. But if we measure x squared, of course, that has a positive definite value. So this increases with time. And this kind of makes sense. The longer you give it, the further it's going to have moved away. Um, if it was a directed process, so let's say, and no, actually, no, I won't do that because I'll come back to it later. So, um, OK, so let's now write down our equation. So we want to describe the motion of this morphogen, right? So we have, I'll always use rho to denote the uh, concentration. Um, So, what have we got? Our uh, morphogen is changing in time, this standard uh, reaction. Um, we got our diffusion term. Um, so, for those that don't know this term, Nabla, this is the, uh, this is depending on our number of dimensions. If it was one dimension, it would just be d2 dx, uh, three, two dimensions, d2 dy. Um, and so, this is just measuring our spatial derivative, uh, second order. And then, basically, I've got two, uh, general functions here, which is my production and my degradation, all right? And what I want to really talk about um, in the sort of the lecture today is how do we sort of think about these terms and how do we uh, come up with decent models. Now, what's the simplest version? Well, the simplest form that we can take is uh, we just simply say, okay, each molecule is moving, moving around and then it degrades, you know, some protease comes and uh, destroys it. Um, and each degradation is entirely independent of all others. And so this is called the, the linear approximation. And so here, simply that it degrades at some rate mu. Uh, the other simplest thing that we can then do for the production term is say, well, okay, let's take our bicoid case. There's this mRNA in the anterior pole. It's actually a bit spread, and we'll return to that. But for now, we're going to ignore that. And we'll just say, OK, it's uh, in input at some rate j, some flux j. And then uh, this delta x term is basically, this is uh, just ensures that it's only at 0, right? So it's flux is in at 0, and it's not elsewhere um, in it. Now, I want to talk about an important point here, which is that when I moved over to biology and I was doing models like this, there would often be the question in the seminar, ah, you know, you've got three parameters. Oh, it's, you know, what can you really say? How much can you measure? Um, anyone want to guess how many three parameters are there in the solution to this equation? Find the general form of this equation. How many of these parameters do you need to know? Two? One? But I mean, just the general, general shape of this solution to this equation. You think you need, okay? What about if I told you that you could actually find the general solution to this with zero parameters? Right? Um, the general form does not depend on any parameter. And to show you that, and I, I think Vijay covered this briefly, we're going to make a couple of 
And first of all, we're going to describe this, the k length, lambda. So lambda squared is d over mu. Um, so does that make sense? Diffusion has dimensions of meters squared, seconds to minus one. This has dimensions of seconds to minus one. So this has dimension of meters squared. Um, and so then I'm going to start defining some dimensionless uh, parameters. So I'm now going to get rid of my distance. So this is my x, my distance. Lambda has dimensions of distance. So I'm now going to define a dimensionless distance, u. I also don't like time. Time's a pain. So I'm going to get rid of that too. So I'm going to find a dimensionless time tor. So this is still dimensionally makes sense. So this is just a number now. It goes from 0 upwards. It's scaled by this mu, which gives you the time scale. And then, in fact, you can uh, define a dimensionless concentration phi, um, where, uh, so if you actually go through and sit through the, the dimensions, these actually almost look fun. Uh, not on this one, I believe. Uh, no, because my I defined degradation as um, time, so it's a degradation rate rather than a degradation time. This is one over t, yeah. Now this has got dimensions of seconds. This has got dimensions of seconds to the minus one. So it's one over seconds to the minus one. So People often define it as a time degradation time, which is then it's, it would be the wrong way around. But I've defined it in this case as a, as a rate. How is dimensionless? Yes. Yes. Sorry. Sorry. I'm kind of going a bit fast, uh, but um, I, as a classic annoying lecturer, I leave it as an exercise to the reader. Um, <laughs> So if you substitute this in, and I'll give you one clue, which is that for those that don't, this is a kind of a weird function. Um, for those that don't know, this actually has dimensions of 1 over x. Uh, so in fact, if you substitute delta x is equal to delta uh, u lambda, that's equal to 1 over lambda delta u. Uh, and with that, with that little piece of information, um, and I do leave this as an exercise to the reader, and I really strongly encourage you to do it, that you can rewrite your equation. I'm just going to do it in 1D. So I had this model for the formation of the morphogen gradient. It had three parameters. It had a production rate, it had a degradation rate, it had a diffusion term. By rescaling my parameters, just by these, uh, what's called a non-dimensionalization, then I was able to uh, re-express my equation in a form where I actually have no parameters. So that means that the general shape of this solution, it doesn't depend on what parameter I take. It has the same general shape. Obviously, the specific parameters tune that shape into particular, makes it larger, makes it taller, but it doesn't change the overall shape of the solution. Um, and so, of course, this then has the solution. Um, and so you can then substitute things back in. And uh, you can get then, if you now actually undimensionalize it and put the dimensions back in, you get the final form. And the, this is, that's the steady state solution. Um, and I think this, the important point I wanted to make here, it's almost an aside, but I think it's an important one, is that when we do theory in biology, we often get criticized for having so many parameters. And actually, that's not an undue criticism. Often are too many. But it's also worth bearing in mind that often there aren't as many parameters, free parameters as they appear. And I think it's an important thing to realize that, in fact, you can um, show that the general shape of solutions doesn't necessarily depend on the value, all right? And I think that's an important point. And to Mo, when we do feedback and feed forward, when we do the same trick, we'll actually reduce it to one parameter. Because often with these feedback and feed forward systems, you get switching behavior. So you have two very different solutions. But you only have two different solutions. And essentially, that one parameter defines 
switching between the two. And so the, so the complete dimension free nature is because you assumed the infinite size system. Uh, In a finite size system, you'd have one parameter ratio of lambda to the system size. You would get, that's a good question. I think you do, yes, it comes into the boundary term. But what happens is this all then becomes a function of x over L. Um, and then this gets defined by, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I would ignore the right hand boundary. No, no, but this, uh, I, can, I can still put the boundary condition in here. Um, uh, you, of phi at x equal at, at u equals l over lambda equals zero. Um, so I still no the solution is more complicated, but it's still dimensionless. It still doesn't need a free parameter. It comes back into the solution afterwards. The boundary condition doesn't depend on l. If I had some length. Sorry. I'm in a finite uh, yeah. box. Yeah then you can use either the box to scale your length or you can use lambda yes. to scale your yes, length. Yes, you can, yes. So the ratio of lambda to L is one parameter that will remain. That could be, yes, yeah, yes. And it's also worth saying that there's no unique uh, non-dimensionalization. In fact, uh, there's a very good book, which I'm trying to remember the name of the title, um, where they actually spend an entire chapter going through different dimensionalizations. Um, and um, yeah, okay, but that's just the general point. So, okay, so this is our, our simple model. Uh, is it a good one? Well, let's wonder. Let's see if we can do something a bit more complicated. And I'm glad that Munia put up a particular slide that she did. So she actually uh, showed the um, uh, dorsal gradient in Drosophila. Um, and uh, it forms a gradient around from the uh, central to dorsal side. Um, and it forms a gradient. Now, there are lots of different models for how this happens. But it turns out this does not move, and to come back to the earlier question, the diffusion in this case is not the same. In this case, in fact, there's what's called shuttling. So the molecules can't just move by themselves. They have to have chaperones that take them. And a consequence of that is that their dynamics are changed. And one model, actually not quite for this system, but for a very similarly related one, is that, well, if we have uh, shuttling going on um, or some sort of restriction on our molecule, then we could imagine something more complicated. So, for example, why, you know, this linear degradation model, maybe we could have something which is uh, quadratic, i.e., the morphogen being in a region, if there's more morphogen there, then it degrades more rapidly. And there are a number of ways that we can actually imagine that. Uh, so now, uh, we can actually go through um, a similar trick to before, although it's slightly nastier. But the point I want to make here is that we get obsessed by this exponential solution, but anyone know what the solution in steady state of this equation is? This is a general form. I don't need like the exact number. Do you think it's the steady state solution is an exponential? There's some shaking heads. Anyone know what the form or want to guess what the form is? I, I can't hear very clearly. Anyone want to think it's logarithmic? Exponential, algebraic. Does anyone know what? So, um, I almost want to give it as a challenge. Uh, uh, no, I won't. Um, for the sake of time, um, it turns out. The uh, an algebraic form is just a um, decaying power law. So. Uh, and, if you, and again, I will leave it as an exercise for the reader to tell me what the values of a and x naught are. Uh, they're not too, not too bad to get, but they're not, they're not straightforward. But I will write them down for you. Um, so, And this is, again, assuming infinite boundary condition on the right, and uh, this um, point flux in on the left. Um, so this has a, a power law form. And if you actually plot it, so your exponential goes down. What's the difference fundamentally between a power law 
and an exponential, large distances, which is larger at large distances. Who thinks the exponential is larger here? What about the power law? Yeah. So key thing is that power laws are, have what we call as a long tail, right? So you have these long tail distributions. And, uh, but actually, they fundamentally look pretty similar. And um, so Nama Barkai, I guess, if you want to look up more on this stuff, uh, Nama has done some great work and has gone through a lot of the derivations of this and actually shows some plausible systems where this sort of mechanism uh, may be more pertinent. But I wanted to just get this going, just to kind of motivate where I actually wanted to go, which is, so this is showing how, with some simple mathematical ideas, A, that we're not over-parameterizing, right? This is, we can describe the fundamental dynamics in quite straightforward terms, um, and we can describe potentially quite complex and different dynamics and still get usable solutions that we can work with. Um, so at that point, which is half an hour in, I'd like to really now look at this first question that I put on the board over there on the left, which is how precise. And so what do I mean, what do I even mean by that, right? So we always see this nice gradient and we say, oh, look, you know, we, we have our threshold concentration and we read off our threshold position. Um, is that how biology works? For the biologists in the audience, you know, if you've done your experiment twice, does it ever look the same? Uh, uh, and it was, it was quite depressing for me when I realized this was not the case. And this is also a good example as a theorist, always, always, always get your hands on raw data. Um, I started off working with published data and it was frustrating and then getting hands on raw data made a huge difference. And uh, the reality is that that's one MBO, and the next MBO looks like that, and the next one looks like that, and the next one looks like that. And the important thing to realize here is that this is not because you're bad at experimenting, although it could be, actually. Yeah. <laughs> like, okay, it's probably because you're bad at experimenting, but if you're in the... Uh, the there were, uh, <laughs> no. Once you've practiced and got good at it, it shouldn't be because you're bad at doing experiments, right? Um, it's because biology is an inherently active system where every single cell, every single embryo is different. They're different sizes, they're different geometries, they have different levels. So the level of bicoid mRNA put in by the mother is different every time, all right? So, uh, yeah, there is definitely experimental error. But hopefully, um, if you measure things carefully, then you actually um, will realize that there's real biological error. And so the question is, how, how do we actually um, understand that it's effect? So we have this model in the morphogen field, of course, that you have, you have some threshold concentration corresponds, I'm just going to put both zero because I can't be bothered to write out, um, threshold position, right? So we could invert this. That's right. Um, so the point is that for a specific threshold concentration, you have a threshold position. And this is ultimately what we want, right? Or we. I'm anthropomorphizing again. The developing Drosophila embryo needs to have boundaries at specific locations. Munia showed you that they are precise to one cell, right? one nucleus, sorry. Right? So um, how do you make sure that you do this as precisely as possible? And I think the early Drosophila embryo is a great system for this because we know we have this single nucleus accuracy. We know we can actually do it, but uh, if, you, if you just think about it from a physics point of view, of all the variables, right, size, temperature, the viscosity, the levels of energy that's in the system, so the amount of yolk that's been put in there, the different levels of maternal inputs that will have been put in there, there are so many variables. That in many ways, it's almost unbelievable that it works. It does. Um, and so there's been a lot of awesome work over the last 10 or 15 years really try to understand that. And I probably suspect, is Bill going to talk about this? Yeah, so the so next week you will hear from Bill really, I think, some of the real gory details of how it does that. Um, and it's not where I want to focus, because he's going to focus more on the downstream part. But we can ask ourselves, well, can we actually put some numbers on how to quantify this? So um, the first thing to do then is to realize that, okay, so let's assume that we've got some noise, right? So let's assume it's real noise, not, not, not student noise. And so we have, we have some rho plus delta rho, right? Uh, so 
that's going to shift our That's going to shift our threshold position by some distance. Uh, now, so did they do Taylor expansions? Yep. So if you, if you Taylor expand uh, to first order, then um, what's that? Right. Um, so this, this, so now you can write, actually what we want is delta x, not delta rho, so we can now write this as delta x equal to delta rho over um, What am I missing? One thing that I'm missing here. What's the problem with this as a measure for the error? Okay. Yeah, so well, the main issue I have is that, yeah, I think this has to, you have to take the absolute value. My gradient's negative. Um, you can't have minus four error, okay? It's a positive number. Um, so what this is saying is that my positional error is equal to my error in my concentration divided by the gradient of that concentration at that point. Now, does that kind of make sense? Well, I, let's see. I think the, okay, does this make sense? If I have large concentration fluctuations, I have large error. That kind of thing is, is what we're measuring here, really. The delta x is measuring these differences, right? Um, but what about this gradient term? Well, let's think if we drew, if we had a gradient like this, right? Even if we have quite a large error here, we have some, uh, we have our threshold concentration. Our delta x is small, whereas if we have a so now we take a smaller delta rho, but we have a that's a gradient, and we actually have a larger delta x. So I hope intuitively this formula um, makes sense. You know, your your error is proportional to the error in your input which kind of makes sense, but also importantly, how steep your input is. So steeper inputs can mask big error. That's kind of important. Uh, no, it would be the steepness at the point you are measuring. So, yeah, so it's the average steepness of the, of the um, mean field solution. Yeah, in this approximation. Uh, so in fact, the first work I ever did in biology was doing it stochastically and solving it properly, and it, it's a pretty good approximation. It's not perfect, um, but it's pretty close. Uh, okay. So now we want to find what this is. So this is how accurate is my gradient? And of course, this can be a function of position, because this is a function of position. This is a function of position. And so um, I'm now going to trek back to the other side of the board, I guess. Rub off. Are there any questions whilst I rub uh, the board? I am not at all, but I will be in two pages' time. Um, so this is, yeah, so this is now actually, this is a good time to, to phrase this. All the sources of error that I discussed well, actually, not all of them. Um, differences like how much um, mRNA the mother laid down, how big the embryo is, you could turn that as an extrinsic source of noise, right? So that's something that's kind of outside the embryo's control. And uh, this, what I put up there, is a measure for the extrinsic error in uh, the, in the uh, positional information. I will, in a minute, talk about the intrinsic error, which is exactly what you're referring to, I think. Um, I'll just delete up till here. So it's changing the production rate, the flux of new molecules coming in. So let's assume that we have some, uh, our, our 
source of error in the um, uh, concentration is in fact um, the word there is it's a dimensionless thing. Um, so we say that the, the sort of the fluctuations in our uh, concentration are basically due to fluctuations in the production rate. Okay? And why do I have these terms over here? Well, the simple answer is to make them non-dimensional, so it's simple, but uh, you could just do it as a Taylor expansion again. So you could just have rho equals j plus delta j, and then you expand and get the term. Um, so we can now write, so our delta rho is equal to delta j over j times rho. So we go to our formula for delta x. So we have delta j j times rho. That's our delta rho term. Now, this we can rewrite, of course, as minus rho over lambda. The absolute terms. So that cancels. That cancels. So positional error anywhere in an exponential gradient, if you're just tuning this part, basically, so you're just moving this up and down, which is essentially this delta j, doesn't depend on position. It's quite remarkable. Like, so the readout position of the exponential gradient is the same everywhere. So it's got some how much error there is in your input, and then just determined by your decay length. A long decay length, you have larger error. That makes sense because your gradient is flatter. Uh, short decay length, you have shorter error. But of course, if you have a short decay length, you can only you limit the field with which you can define your information. Yes, uh, yes, so what I'm teaching here, you're right, is delta rho naught, yeah. And which, what I'm arguing there is the, the biologically, the primary cause of that would be variations in production rate. Uh, and so that's why I basically switched rho naught to j. Been a bit lazy, but uh, I, could have, I could do this just as easy as delta rho naught over rho naught as the, as the level of noise. Um, and it turns out actually that uh, people have measured this. So uh, I think the, the lab that's really done uh, I guess the most uh, stuff on this is Thomas Gregor's lab at Princeton, uh, where he has really dedicated his uh, time to making sure that when they measure these gradients and they measure their readouts, they're actually measuring real variation and not uh, experimental variation. Um, and so if you want to know more about a lot of this, um, his work is really built on it. But the key thing really here is that it's spatially independent. Um, which is not, I think, from that right-hand formula at all obvious. And it actually, it turns out somewhat unbelievably as well, although there's actually a general reason for it, but um, if we have our... Ah, ah, it's the first one to die. If we have our general form here... Uh, Um, this actually, and I, for the sake of time, give you the answer. So again, in this power law-like gradient, you actually don't, again, depend on where you are in the gradient in terms of your positional information. The precision with which you can read out a specific point so whether it's here or whether it's here, this sort of a different bow T, or whether it was up here, the precision is the same, all positions. Uh, and yeah. again, for those of you that are keen, uh, you're very welcome to, to derive that. Um, but one thing that's interesting here is that you notice that there's this prefactor. So if you actually look at uh, these two gradients, um, they actually don't look that different, uh, except for towards, so this is the power law, um, and then this is exponential going down. Um, they're actually pretty similar in terms of their shape. 
Uh, and so what that means in reality is that, for, for example, for Drosophila, Bicoid, lambda is around 80 to 100 microns. And if you actually fit the data with an X naught, you actually get a similarish number. It's about 130, 140. Um, but the delta X is smaller because you've got this factor of a third. And uh, so this has actually been, uh, Nama Barkay has argued that this is a possible reason why you might have power law gradients. Because power law gradients are generally less susceptible, or they have, they have higher precision in the presence of external production fluctuation. Now, does that make sense? Well, yes, it does. Because of what's happening in this term here. If you overproduce, you have too much, you've got to square it. So basically, you ramp up your degradation, and you bring the levels down. If you underproduce, of course, again, if you think you go, if one is normal, if you go under one and you square it, then it gets a lot smaller than one. And so you massively turn off your degradation. And so in fact, it's the fact that you have essentially a feedback on the amount of uh, morphogen that's buffering, as we say, the um, external fluctuations in production. And so one can argue that this is a more precise model for reading out external fluctuations. But then that's a nice lead-in to the question that came earlier, is what about intrinsic? So here is a really important uh, point to make, which is if you, if you had the perfect experimental condition, you had two embryos which were identical. They had identical bicoid mRNA in the pole. They had identical morphology. They had identical level of all the hunchback um, maternal factors. After two hours, they would not look the same. They would look extremely similar, but they would not look the same. Right? And that's because in uh, the processes going on, such as the bursting uh, that we've already heard about, are probabilistic. They're stochastic, right? They're not deterministic. And so that means that within the embryo, you have fluctuations. And the classic one, of course, is diffusion. And so you also have uh, what I would term as noise nowadays. Uh, so this is due to the inherent stochastic variability of a biological system. And we're going to keep it simple. In fact, uh, what Munia does gets horrible, and it does not obey this. But we're going to take it to be Poisson noise. Essentially, what do I mean by Poisson noise? I mean the error goes as the square root of the number. Um, and that's a very good estimation for diffusive processes. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, um, did I have it in the notes? Yeah, I actually, um, okay, it was going to be one of my, uh, again, if, you, if you're bored tonight and you, you, you know, in bed early, uh, without looking up, without looking up Nama's papers, tell me what the general solution of, uh, not good. And it's interesting. Um, and it gets very interesting as you go to infinite n as to how the behavior maps back on. So it also solve for that. And then it turns out that this holds exactly the same, but this prefactor is a function of n. Tell me what that function is. And what's that limit of that function at large n? And how does that compare with the exponential? Um, like you can, if you don't want to do the calculation but you're interested, Go look up Nama's, I think it's a 2003 dev cell paper. Uh, it's all in the SI, actually. Um, if you want to have some fun, and I'm a geek and like that sort of thing, um, then you can solve it yourself uh, and see if you get it right. But the short answer is yes. For all n greater than 1, there is a power law solution to this equation. Good. Okay. So, Poisson process, which means that it goes as the square root of the number of molecules, so we take that as a proxy concentration. Um, there's a lot of details here about how big your volume is, what is the thing that you're looking at, and this actually really comes back to what Munio was talking about, because you now have to have an 
So this is your measuring volume. So if you're measuring some noise, you have to be measuring in the volume. What's the relevant spatial domain of that? It can be the transcriptional factor binding site on the DNA, because that's what's being interpreted. Um, but that, that um, and so that, that's an important point. And we, but it, also the delta x can vary depending on on particular system. So of course now we have a we have um, delta rho internal that is going as rho to the half. And we've also we've got over there, for example, we have a we have an external which we can argue goes as something like this delta j. So we have some variation. Um, and in fact, in the very first biology paper I ever wrote, uh, I don't know if I'd call it biology, actually. Um, if you assume these two are independent, then you can actually analyze what the positional readout is. And it turns out that there are different domains when exponentials are better, power laws are better, and so on. Because, of course, uh, this massively penalizes low numbers. So, uh, in reality, the, the relevant scale is actually... Uh, delta rho over rho. So if I put that in, uh, this becomes a minus a half. So basically, when you have low, you've probably all heard of low copy number fluctuations, or you know, uh, and so this is essentially that. So that as your concentration goes small, this noise ramps up massively. Uh, this makes sense again if we always always draw it. So um, now I'm going to draw my gradient, but with with uh, noise. So. Right? So here, actually, this noise doesn't really matter. It may, it may move me a little bit, but still, fundamentally, I'm, I'm pretty safe. Right? Um, but here, you know, the same, because of these fluctuations, I'm measuring six different positions read out as my readout. So essentially, my, it can no longer be read out. It's essentially, uh, I'd say it's in the noise level. Um, so you can see this is a nice way of just pictorially seeing that the importance of intrinsic fluctuations depends on your concentration. And you can go through this, but I don't want to do that too much. And it, yeah, and the point is that here that it turns out, of course, the exponential and the power law behave differently. Uh, different effects. So to finish this, I just want to end with just two comments. It turns out that if you go and put all the numbers in for Bicoid and look at the number of hunchback binding sites is downstream vector, uh, it can't work. As in, the error that the gradient should be giving to the readout position is much larger than this single nucleus error. And when this was first uh, discussed by in fact, Thomas and Bill Berlek, uh 10 years ago now, or 12 years ago, they kind of hypothesized some solutions. So what do you think they could be? How can you reduce this error? Yeah, so feedback, basically. So feedback is absolutely the correct answer for, say, the um, nervous system, which has a much longer time scale to work on. The problem here, as you've just heard in the previous lecture, is you have six minutes. Doesn't, feedback is too slow. But yes, that's absolutely correct, for example, for sonic hedgehog signaling in the nerve cord. I actually have been given one of the answers already by Munia. Remember someone asked her about what happens about the transport? They move around. Said that they, you actually have these nuclei are in, they're in domains, but they're not actually in cells, right? They're actually open at the bottom. So this is the surface of the embryo. And they create these transcripts. And in fact, it turns out these transcripts can move around. And so what they essentially are doing, because you said they spatially average, they are uh, helping to smooth out the local signal. So it turns out that you can have spatial and, well, they're kind of related, but you can have spatial and temporal averaging. So the system essentially doesn't just make an instant readout. If the gradient was being interpreted as an instantaneous, okay, I want to decide whether or not to make a hunchback molecule, I'm going to decide now, it would fail terribly. That the error would be around three to four cell nuclei. Right? And so I'll uh, take a second. Um, and so one thing that we do know is that, in fact, the transcripts 
move around between the local nuclei, and essentially that helps to average out that local signal. So no longer are you just making a snapshot junction, snapshot decision on this one, but in fact you're making a decision based on sort of your neighboring three or four uh, uh, nuclei. And if you do that, actually you can get the error down. There was a question. Yes, exactly. And so, uh, and that's because you've got, you haven't got cells. So the bottom is open. And so you've basically free to move, or, move around. Um, and actually, in answer to the previous question, so uh, like I, I recently heard Eric Bischoff talking about this. And was, he, was at, he was at pains to emphasize that although there are a lot of similarities between the AP patterning in, in the early Drosophila embryo and the um, uh, nerve cord patterning in vertebrates, there's a lot of similarities, but this is one key difference, right? And in those systems, feedback is more important. Here, his argument, and I think I buy it, is that this system is just trying to do it as fast as it possibly can. And in this case, this is how it can do it, because it can take advantage of the fact it's, not a, it's one cell rather than um, multiple ones. Uh, but this is probably not a general mechanism. You tell me I got it all wrong. <laughs> There may be, I'm, I'm not so up on this literature at the moment. Uh, they didn't used to, so there have been order of magnitude estimates made. So in fact, Bill Bilek, um, they had an argument in the original cell paper in 2007 where they argued that the, the order of magnitude of the, so the increase in precision due to spatial averaging by this mechanism was sufficient to get it down to the time scales needed. Um, but I'm not aware of anyone who's actually done the detailed simulation of it, trying to use a realistic environment. Um, that's, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so that's ending my first part on how precise. Uh, so um, then essentially I want to get on to the second part. I've got, what, half an hour, so we'll see how far we get. I can just, I guess I can continue to mow. It's, uh, um, No, they don't. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't think they move through the yolk. The yolk axis is kind of a boundary, um, and so what the yolk is essentially doing is making everything happen in this thin film around the outside. Uh, there are some people that claim that things move through the yolk, and definitely some things do. But I think for the setting up of the gradients and the readout of the positional information, I'm. I don't see how it could work, if, exactly as you explained. Like, if the yolk starts taking in stuff, the yolk is huge. It's 90% of the embryo volume at this point. Uh, yeah, it's not going to work. So it, it, it can't work, but I can't give you evidence that it can't work, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yeah. yeah, they don't see anything. But there are some papers that claim that there's yolk transport. But I, yeah, <laughs> we, I think we're in agreement. Um, OK, now what I want to do, though, is uh, really try to get this idea of questioning our assumptions, right? So, so we've started off by writing down this nice model. Um, uh, write it up again, but so we have actually a hell of a lot of assumptions written down on the board, uh, and it's worth trying to unpack that. So as a start, is this a good approximation? So it turns out that some people went, oh, hang on, I don't think it is. So if you actually look at the, if you do an in situ against Bitcoin RNA, it's like that. So this is the Bitcoin gradient, and then this is the RNA. And so the idea here is that you don't have this local point source where everything is getting pumped in just from the end, but in fact, you have a distributed source. So in fact, a more reasonable function instead of j delta x would be something like uh, d e to the minus. Uh, this is some new length scale. Um, and it turns out actually that doesn't change things massively. Uh, it actually gives you a better fit to the data, uh, which is nice. Uh, but that's not particularly radical. And then some people came along a few years later and said, well, 
hang on, let's, let's actually try to push this to um, a few slides. Let's try and push this a bit and say, okay, well, we have all this complexity, we have all these nuclear division cycles going on all the time. Uh, why not just define So the idea came out of the RNA gradient. So the concept here is, well, you know, why have all these complex dynamics and trying to set up these scales across large range? Why don't we just build our gradient in the, in the oocyte, in the egg chamber, as the, as the egg is being made in the, in the mother, and then you just have local production. So this is now... Even for those of you who are sort of petrified by maps, this now equation is nice and easy to solve because, of course, it's now just uh, nice and simple, and you have your gradient. Uh, and you can, there are papers um, claim to observe these long range uh, bicoid RNA transcripts in the embryo. And particularly in the very early embryo, so in nuclear cycles two, three, four, when at that point the nuclei are still deep inside the yolk, uh, then people have observed transcripts quite far into the embryo. And so they've used this as an argument. Um, and so this is, one, this is one alternative model. Like you don't have to have diffusion. Um, another model, which is not relevant for Bitcoin, but I want to, to raise it because I think it's a very nice model and it's very relevant, uh, you're going to have to excuse my artistic drawing of cells. Um, uh, I'm just drawing cells. Uh, this is meant to be an epithelial sheet. Uh, but the point I want to say is that... So there was this idea from Thomas Kornberg, um, and has now been followed up by others, which is, well... I have some source cells which are producing my morphogen, and they need to get this morphogen to these cells in this field. And um, uh, a field, I mean like an epithelial sheet of cells. The classic model is diffusion, but they came up with this alternative idea, which is, well, instead of that, why don't I just build a train track from my source cell to my cell of interest? Um, so these are filopodia protrusions. Uh, they're actually in the literature known as cytonemes. And uh, now there's actually some reasonably decent evidence that in some systems, morphogen doesn't really diffuse. It doesn't leave its cell where it's, it doesn't leave the source cell by extracellular extrusion and then diffusion through the extracellular space. Instead, what it does is it actually moves along the cytonemes and then gets deposited at its. Um, target cell. So the interesting thing here is you're going to hear from Bill about this concept of positional information. I've kind of deliberately stayed away from there. What I've wanted to talk about today is positional precision. Two are obviously related, but they are different. Um, and what, they, what you've done here is your spatial information is no longer encoded in your morphogen. It's encoded in your cytoskeletal network. It is uh, built up these train tracks around um, the sort of from the source cells. And so uh, I think now uh, a good example is Wintz in the early uh, zebrafish embryo. There seems pretty strong evidence that this is a process where it seems to be actually working in tandem with diffusion. So it's not like often, common, this is one of those cases in biology as well where, and well, this happens in physics as well, where uh, you know, you get two big sides, and they don't like each other, and they're like, ah, oh, we got our model, and we got mo your model's wrong, and vice versa. Uh, almost certainly that in a lot of systems, you probably have a bit of both, particularly once you get to complex cellular systems, where diffusing through this extracellular environment is not trivial, right? It's very, very built up. Um, and in fact, I, I printed it out. Uh, there's an absolutely brilliant review um, by Muller. Here, this is development 
2013. So has these wonderful images of uh, drunken sailors coming into port and talking about how the drunken sailors can move through the port under different uh, regimes. And it really goes through the problems of how do you want to move through a, a dense tissue and the cytonemes is an alternative. But I just wanted to really raise the issue here. And I think as a physicist, often when you come to these biological problems, you read the diffusion literature and you're like, oh, yes, you know, I model it with my diffusion term. In fact, biology's found other solutions. Uh, and so the cytonemes is the classic one. And it's actually something I feel has been theoretically very poorly explored. Um, uh, there's not actually many papers on it. That's the source of some considerable debate. Uh, comfortably up to 50 microns. That's pretty uncontentious. Uh, in the early Zebrafish embryo, uh, Stefan Schlopp at Exeter, I claim to have seen ones up to 120. What they see is like a kind of like a relay mechanism. So individual cytonemes aren't necessarily that long, but there's a kind of a feedback, which is, as far as I know, not well understood, that essentially creates like, you know, like station stops. And, on. Um, and this is something that's very, I think theoretically has been very poorly looked at. I, probably, but it's a one-way diffusion on a train track, essentially. So it's much faster. I believe it's the protein, because they've done it with FTF and done it with WIMPs. And I believe they've been tagging the protein, yes. And so the problem is that these are very, very faint. So when you look at the imaging, what you see in the, in the data is this is basically uh, maxed out at 255 or whatever. And then you have these tiny little points here. Um, and I actually didn't believe it for years. It was only when I saw the fish data, Stefan Schlopp's group, where to me that was the most believable because, because the optics is better. You can actually see the cytonemes more clearly without massively overexposing everything else. Um, and so I think it's real. Um, and I think it's complementary. I, I don't see them as two separate. But uh, there's been very little work on it, actually. Yeah. It's not known. And of course, uh, the question you always got to ask, if people are, give you a talk about, ah, oh, it's morphogens, it's rubbish, it's all cytonemes, ask them where does the cytoneme network come from? And in my experience, there's normally a pause and they kind of move on um, because it's not known. It's a really interesting question. It's, they, probably it's feedback. And you know, there's some sort of goal where like, okay, this was a good connection, I'll reinforce it. How that happens is really, would be really cool, but I don't think it's very well known. No, it's, it's a, an excellent question. Uh, and that's something that, so people like Thomas Gregor have been doing this sort of, sort of single nuclei level precision measurements. And that's how in the early embryo, we, it's one of the evidences that we really know that it's diffusive or will be diffusive. Um, as far as I'm aware in this literature, it's partly because it's just so much harder. To be fair to the experimentalist, this is really hard to image and to follow. And so the level of precision and the data quality is not there where you can start looking at the noise. Because at the moment, the experimental noise is probably higher than the real noise. Uh, so um, but that, it should be different. It should be like if it's a 1D train track versus essentially 2D diffusion through the epithelial space, that should be measurable. It's in here to distinguish. But uh, I don't think the data is there yet. OK, so that's assumption uh, uh, about the production. And actually, that's, this also links into here. You, know, you don't have to worry about that. And I've already talked previously about the Barkai work where you could have a row squared. And so I think the really important thing here is to, is to keep an open mind. Um, and, but as you also inferred, is that in fact, um, got earlier, colored chalks, very exciting. So it turns out, actually, that if you um, take so the SDD model, that's the name for the standard one. Do this nice exponential, right? Uh, you can do this RNA gradient model. Give you a nice curve. Um, Das Schwarzman at Princeton has actually shown that, in fact, I, I don't even need to have degradation. 
if I tune my diffusion constant well enough, I basically get rid of this, and I include in my model the fact that the nuclei are always dividing, and essentially that's acting to dilute the bicoid signal, um, I can get a gradient like this. So this is called the shuttling model. So this is still got diffusion, but no degradation. So um, Yellow, we'll say, is the uh, RNA gradient. Ah, can't wait anymore. And it turns out that even there's a, another model. I thought I had four. I do. Um, I'll do it. Uh, so some people kind of, kind of came along and said, well, you know, does it have to be the protein that diffuses? It could be the RNA. So your RNA gets deposited locally and it diffuses through the system. And it turns out that in all of these models, and again, physicists should probably be able to work this out, you can find a range of solutions which looks like an exponential at the right time. So you want to be, as Munir was talking about, you want to be read out at roughly two hours into development. So you choose your parameters so that two hours into development, you have a beautiful exponential gradient in all four models. So how do you distinguish these models? Right? And that's where I want to spend the last 20 minutes of the talk. So the key point here is that our, our, our tool that we've been using now very successfully for 20 years is live imaging. And live imaging typically of a protein tagged with a fluorophore. And reading out that intensity is a proxy for concentration. And that provides us with a lot of things. We can do some more clever things like FRAP or FCS. Um, but fundamentally, that's this readout of concentration is our main tool that we've been using in the many, many systems. And that fails here because they're all the same. Right? Uh, so the question is, how do we distinguish them? And that's why I want to come to the last part, which is really about the importance of dynamics and something that you can't ignore. I'm just going to wrap up one last time. Okay. Tim? So, um, even before you go to dynamics, even, if, even for the several of these models, if you look at the steady state concentration, it will have some fluctuations. There will be some wiggly things. If you do a cross correlation, you should be able to get out the. the... <sighs> yes and no. You should, but it's hard. Um, so, my lab actually does FCS on Bitcoin. And. Um, you do 10 embryos, and you'll always get two or three, which you get measurements which are way out. And home with those techniques, I actually think they're great techniques, and we use them. But um, if you want to use the fluctuations in your readout of FCS measurement as a way of distinguishing models, that's difficult, because the fluctuations are so large, as in your error bars on FCS measurement. Not at the precision, I think, to do that, or at least getting the N high enough to get there is not yet at that level. Um, and FRAP is not the way to do this. Um, FRAP does not measure diffusion. Uh, one point to make. Um, so I'll show you another way. I have, a, I have another way. So, but before we do that, let's, let's play a simple game. This is all too complicated. I don't like second order PDEs are not easy, uh, even when they're linear. So let's start with a nice simple model. This is model one. What's the solution? Anyone want to tell me what the solution is? An exponential, yep. Yeah. OK. If you start with an initial condition of 0, that's the solution, right? OK, so we're going to call this model 1. Model 2, dA by dt equals. What's the solution? It's an exponential. In fact, it's exactly the same. So if you were to measure the concentration of this, let's say this is some factor in your cell, 
um, you get exactly the same. And these are both plausible models. You have some RNA laid down. It degrades. It, it produces the protein. It degrades over some time. And you, you assume that the degradation of the RNA is much faster than the degradation of the protein. So you ignore the protein degradation. You get this. This is just standard. You have production and degradation. So you have two very different models for how to create a concentration inside a cell. But yet, they've got identical temporal behavior. So how do you distinguish them? Um, and the point that I want to get across is age. So in these two models, although they have exactly the same dynamics in terms of the mean concentrations, they have very different properties if you were to consider a single protein. So in the first model, you know, our protein is made, it moves around, and then it dies, right? Uh, on what time scale does it die? Yeah, so this dies roughly one over mu. In this model, our protein is made, it moves around, moves around, it moves around. So how old is my average protein? It's going to be however old your system is whenever you started it, right? So uh, these two models, although they have um, identical behavior, uh, have very different age considered the single, single protein. Um, and so this is a useful tool. And I am going to use that to answer the problem at the end of the board in a second. But I want to just highlight some work um, now I'm worried that I'm going to misspell his name because I didn't write it down. Uh, oh, uh, Stas Schwarzman, who's at Princeton, um, considered a similar but slightly tangential question, which was, how long does it take a dynamic system to reach steady state? Right? And so and they um, actually then defined a way where you could actually work out for a dynamic model how long it would take to get to its steady state. And the key uh, parameter that they, or key function they defined is this. Which, this is my steady state concentration. This is the change in time. So um, at steady state, R is zero, right? If you're, if you're in a system where rho is zero at the start, you start from nothing, then it's one at the start. So basically this function r goes from r to one. And what uh, Stas showed in a couple of very nice papers is that the time to reach steady state on average is uh, and what's nice here is that they can get this as a function of x. So, um, and you, you should look up his papers if you want to see derivation. It's not particularly complicated. Um, I think the, the, the paper is Gordon, uh, others, yes. But what's very nice here is that they actually uh, could calculate, for example, for this model, how long it would take to get to steady state. And it turns out, So near, if you're right at the source, right, where the protein is made, the only thing determining how old the protein is is how quickly it dies. Because diffusion is basically not an important variable. As you move away, because don't forget lambda, just in case, because it's been a long time since we discussed it, this is diffusion over degradation. Um, so as we move away, the average time it takes to reach steady state increases with position linearly. Now it turns out, and this was something that was quite fun when I discovered it, uh, if I take the STD model, if you take a single particle and you calculate its average position and average age when it dies, right, and uh, actually do, do the math properly, you find that the average age of a particle in the STD model at a position x is equal to 
it's the same. Um, and there were, uh, but so this is basically saying that if you want to know, the, and this, let's see if this makes sense. What's the average age of a particle at zero, really near the source? You've got lots and lots and lots of young protein, right? It's just being made. So this is zero, this is, so it's small. As we move further away, only older protein gets further away because it has to diffuse there, right? So um, as you get, go further away, your protein gets older, X gets larger, so your average protein age gets older. And so you can actually um, follow a similar trick for the other models and uh, actually derive a... Um, Where's the rubber gone? Uh, no, no. So, because of course, um, at at each point you have a combination of, at a particular position you have some old protein that's about to die, some <coughs> middle-aged protein that's moving around, and some young protein which is going off to the end. But that point, when you measure the Intensities, you're measuring all of those pools. So this is the average. I really I should put averaging bars around it. Uh, this is really this, the average age at that point. So um, it's for that particular gradient. Uh, so it, it makes sense in terms of if you make diffusion larger, then the average age gets smaller at the same position, right? And so because you, you get there faster. So the two are related. And in fact, that's actually kind of a key point Just I'll get to. Um, for the final graph that I'm going to draw for today's lecture, yeah, I'm on time, good. Uh, so now, instead of drawing concentration as a function of position, I want to draw age. So for my SDD model, it goes like this. Um, for the shuttling model, I don't have degradation, right? Uh, it turns out that if I, if I get the solution, what color was the degradation? Shuttling was blue. Um, so doesn't have degradation, the average protein is older. It's still produced locally, it's still produced at the pole, so you're still going to get younger protein on average, but, yeah. uh, which was the next one, pink, RNA, okay, I'm going to leave that one for last. RNA gradient, the point of the RNA gradient is you just produce, you make a gradient of RNA, you make your protein locally, so every protein is the same age. So. Um, and then, in fact, for the RNA diffusion model, it's exactly the same dynamics. It's diffusion, but it's now in the RNA. So now, you start with RNA at the pole, and it diffuses. The protein made near the pole is the oldest. The protein furthest away is the youngest, because you had to wait for the RNA to diffuse there. So in fact, it turns out the RNA model looks like that. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, yes. Oh. I was trying to use the same color scheme, but that's probably really confusing. RNA diffusion, uh, RNA gradient. Uh, so STD is source diffusion degradation. So. They're identical gradients, which if you were to measure the concentrations, look identical. But if you look at their ages, they all are very distinct. And so essentially, in the last five minutes, I'll actually talk about some biology experiment, uh, which is, well, can you actually measure the age of the protein? And it turns out that you can uh, by a very neat trick. And again, this is something that's probably we should all know and be more careful of, but often we're a bit lazy. When you're taking your image of your protein with its GFP, and you image that at that point, that at a particular time point, are you imaging the actual concentration of that molecule at that position? You've got a, you've got a molecule, let's call it A. You've got a GFP. And I come in with my microscope, and I measure the level of GFP. Am I getting the correct level of A? Yeah. Why? Why? Exactly. So the point is that the GFP has to fold. 
It doesn't fold instantly. In fact, GFP typically takes around 45 minutes to fold. This is something we often forget. Uh, and so when you see a signal coming up in your microscope, actually, the signal was there half an hour beforehand. It's just that the GFP took half an hour to fold. And so um, a guy called Michael Knopp, who was at Embol and is now in Heidelberg, uh, actually realized that you could uh, use this to do something quite clever, which is, let's not just do this, but I'm going to now put another molecule on here. I'm going to put superfolded GFP and an M cherry on my protein. And let's say my superfolded GFP folds in 10 minutes and my M cherry folds in 60 minutes. And what do I see in the experiment? I start my experiment, and let's say A just starts getting produced. So for the first 10 minutes or so, I see nothing. Right? And then, uh, ah, another chalk bites the dust. Um, so uh, I won't use, I don't have a green chalk, unfortunately. So for the first 10 minutes, I see nothing, but then I start seeing a GFP yeah, thing will come up, right? But then after about 40 minutes or 50 minutes, I'll start to see an M cherry signal come up. So I can tell how old a protein is. If it's green, if it's only green, I know it's young. If it's green and red with different fractions, I can say how old it is. And so uh, what Michael realized was that if you measure the ratio of this green to red signal, you actually have a proxy for how old that protein that you were measuring is. And because I have two minutes left and I do not want to delay lunch, uh, I will cut uh, to the chase and tell you that, so if you, it's the only bit of biology I ever did, so I'm quite proud of it, but if you take Bicoid and you actually tag superfolded GFP and M cherry, and uh, the beautiful thing about Drosophila is you can make your construct, you can then inject it into the embryos, make a stable line, cross it to the mutant, so that the only copy in your embryo is your altered line. You check that your embryo looks normal, which is a good sign that your altered line is functional, because uh, putting fluorophores on can also change protein dynamics. It actually turns out that I've, we've done this in my lab and it fails. If you use photoactivatable GFP, Bikoi doesn't like it. It clusters and does all sorts of weird stuff. So always, always, always check your fluorophore for defects. A beautiful thing for um, Drosophila is that we can always, always often cross the mutants and check that our protein is functional. And so then we can measure the Bikoi gradient in our embryos. And then we have two gradients. We have a, essentially you have a GFP and you have a cherry. And to actually the question earlier about um, how does the time relate to the, to the position, well, it turns out that you now have two informations. You have the red and the green, or one way we could do it is you can also plot the ratio of these. And it turns out that the ratio, um, and by trying to simultaneously fit this curve and this curve, it turns out that the only model that could fit the data was the STD model. Right? Uh, so basically, uh, the key point is that we essentially have two pieces of information. And it did take a lot of effort to get it right, because what you need is you want your first protein to fold as fast as possible. You want to see signal as quickly as possible. You need your other one to fold on the time scale that you're interested in. Because if this folded on 15 minute time scale versus 10, then this ratio would basically be almost one and virtually, you know, any difference would be within the noise. Because also, as those, when you're measuring ratio, noises get very big. If there's any errors, you're dividing, and now you get, ah. <laughs> uh, and so you get magnif magnification of any noises. Um, but equally, if it's too long, then you just see your primary signal and you don't see anything. So we had to make quite a whole bunch of different lines. To we got it right. So that actually finishes it nicely. Um, and so just to kind of uh, to summarize, um, really the key point is dynamics matter. Uh, you can't just drop the DT term, uh, although we like to. 
Uh, you can sometimes, but you really have to justify it. And I would say that we often don't justify it well enough. And I think that's a fair criticism of my own work in the past. Uh, and then, but the thing is, we can also use it as an advantage. Like, you know, the time that is, in, that is incorporated, the time, temporal information that is encoded in our system can actually tell us something about the system. And so just by dropping the time, we actually lose important stuff and the age. So I think I'll end me for today. Um, so tomorrow, what I'm going to talk about is actually hopefully going to complement the Munio as well, which is the readout. So I'm going to talk about it from a more conceptual manner. So feedback, feed forward, how different modes of regulation of what you use for different types of readout. And also tomorrow, then I'll try to link it in a bit more with uh, some of the other um, sort, of, sort of more related to actually uh, real biology. So I'll talk about the heart. And with that, I think I will end. Thank you.